Children's Church is now dismissed. Going this way over here with Gabby. I'm going to need you guys to keep praying. That's just not enough kids. So if, if you have your bulletin, it shows that we're going to be starting today in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Well, I kind of made modifications since I printed the bulletin, so we're not going to be starting in Ecclesiastes. You can mark that spot in Scripture if you like. We will get to it. It will be the body of the Scripture today, but I, I'm going to share with you the reason why it's the body of the Scripture today is because we are blessed to be in the presence of newlyweds. Amen? Amen. So if you happen to get married this week, would you mind standing up? Thank you. <clears throat> so, uh, we're actually going to be starting the day in Genesis. If you don't mind, open your Bibles, Genesis chapter 2. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 2. And, and I'm, I'm going to share uh, a little bit of this story. Uh, I'm going to share some of Robert and Kim's story, uh, not to embarrass them. Wednesday night when we start with, uh, uh, when we get to confessions, we'll start with Kim and Robert, too. <clears throat> so, amen. The, the reason why the title for this message is You're Not Alone is, is because this is one of those things that just it keeps reoccurring in our culture. It keeps reoccurring in our society. And, and I, I, I'm going to hazard a guess here. There are people in this sanctuary right now that have at some point thought that they were just all alone, that nobody understood them, and that nobody was there, and nobody could help them. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> Scripturally speaking, it's just not true. So for a Christian to feel as though we're all alone, that we're abandoned, that there's no one that can help us, it, it, it's really a sign of, of a lack of faith. And I'm not trying to pick on you or make you feel bad, but if you understood how blessed you really were, if you understood how important you were to God, if you understood that God loved you so much, not only did he create you for that relationship with him, but when he saw that it wasn't working out exactly the way that, that he would prefer for it to go, he sent his son here on this place to be born a child, to be raised into normal, sinful life as an example for the rest of the world. He, he left heaven to come here and show us that example. And, and then because he did such a good job of showing us that example, that we decided the best thing we could do was get rid of him, so we killed him. Can't have people showing us up. And we put him in the tomb and we rolled the stone in front of it and we said, okay, we're done with that. Now we can go on with life as normal. But on the third day, Jesus came out of that tomb. And he came out of that tomb to let you know, ladies and gentlemen, you're not alone. None of you are alone. Each and every one of you has the ability to invite Jesus into your heart. And in that instance, you are at one with the creator of the universe, and you are never alone. I'm going to illustrate that for you in Scripture today, and, and, and I'm doing this because I want you guys to understand that you don't ever have to feel like you're alone because you're not alone. And not only do I not want you to feel like you're alone, not alone, I want you to feel as though you are saved and you are, are blessed and you, you are part of a union between yourself and the heavenly creator that can never be broken by anyone or anything. You are never alone. You are a child of God. So Genesis chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 18. Today's message was supposed to be short. It's supposed to be. We'll see how it ends up. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. I'm not going to read the entire verse. I'm going to read the first half of the verse, and, and, and I'm going to make an illustration, and, and then we're going to be pretty quickly, we're going to be at point one. But in this particular instance, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, And the Lord God said... It is not good that man should be alone. And I'm stopping right there. And, and I'm, I'm going to look down here. 
and say, put your phone away. Sorry. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I'm sorry. I apologize. Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Do you guys need Bibles? Pass up some Bibles. There's none on the front rows. Somebody pull a Bible up and pass it up here. He didn't have his phone out, and, and I just scared him, so. <laughs> Sorry, Chance. Genesis chapter 2, I want you guys to see this. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I want you to see that God said this. I want you to see that God said this without any prompting from you in any context. I want you to see that God cares so much about you that he looked down from heaven onto earth. And what did he see? He saw his, his perfect creation was in the perfect garden, was doing exactly what he was created to do. God himself looked down onto, onto the earth and he said, it's not good for that man to be alone. It's not good for man to be alone. God knew this without you complaining to him about it, and then he actually did something about it. Amen? Amen? So in this particular instance, I want you to understand that God knows where you are, he knows what you're going through, and he knows how to fix that particular problem, and he doesn't need you to tell him how to fix it. Amen? Amen. If we could learn to shut up and listen occasionally, if we could just learn to shut up and listen just occasionally, God's got the answers to our problems. Continuing in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. I will make him a helper comparable to him. Now, see, this is the part that I love really and truly. This is the part where God said, all right, I'm looking down at this perfect creation in this garden where I've done this perfect work and I've got this man doing exactly what he was told to do. And I've decided what he needs is a woman. Gentlemen, you should have all said amen because you know you've been chasing them after them your entire lives and you finally caught one. You're like, oh dear Lord, what do I do now? <clears throat> it's just the truth. I want you to see here that in this particular instance, this is, this is really key. Adam didn't go looking for Eve. He didn't chase her down. He didn't find her at the local mall. He didn't catch her on Snapchat or Instagram. He didn't ask for her digits. That's old school. Now you ask for the snap. In this particular instance, Adam was in the garden doing the work that God had created him to do, and God said, I'm going to do you one better. I'm going to make you a helpmate comparable to you. So in this particular instance, I want you to see here, this is like a first biblical lesson of dating. If you're busy doing what you're supposed to do, bringing greater glory to God, he takes care of the rest of it. He takes care of the rest of it. He, he didn't ask, you know, hey, Adam, I see you're working really hard. Is there something I can do to maybe help you out? And then Adam said, you know, I'd really like a distraction. That's not how it happened. Adam was placed in the garden by God, in God's perfect garden, doing God's perfect work, and he was working hard at it, and God said, it's not good for that man to be alone, so I'm going to make him a helpmate, and it's going to be comparable to him. And I love that particular part, because you know what that means? In this particular instance, what we see here in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, is we see God saying, I'm going to give you a helpmate, not a maid. <laughs> I'm going to give you someone who helps you, who's comparable to you. Your, your second half. In the modern world, we say the better half. <clears throat> but your helpmate is designed to be with you in the perfect place where God put Adam doing what God created Adam to do, the work of God. So we're about to get to point number one, but I can't get there just yet because i got to illustrate this for just a second. Because this is one of those biblical lessons that I'm not sure everybody learned. But in this particular instance, what I want you to see here is that Adam was about doing the work of God, and then he got a helpmate, and his helpmate was supposed to be comparable to him, so his helpmate was supposed to be helping him do the work of God. This is really key here. If you're chasing after someone, and they're not about doing the work of God, you're chasing the wrong person. If you catch the person who's not about doing the work of God, you caught the wrong person. 
If we could focus on that thing that we were created to do to bring greater and greater glory to God, then God will bring to your, your helpmate and your helpmate will be there with you all about doing that very same thing, bringing greater and greater glory to God. So if you've caught one and that one, I don't know, let's just say, didn't want to get up to come to church this morning, <laughs> you caught the wrong one. If you're chasing after one and you invite that one to say, hey, would you mind coming with me to Sunday school? Or would you mind coming with me to, I don't know, Fifth Sunday singing? We're going to have a meal. We're going to play music. And they say, you know what? I, I kind of like you and I don't mind hanging out, but I'm not ready to go to church yet. Then that's the wrong one. Because God put Adam to work. Adam was doing the work. God recognized Adam needed some help and God delivered the help. God did not deliver a distraction. He did not deliver trouble. He, he did not deliver someone to draw you away from him. He delivered someone to help you. And ladies and gentlemen, the only place in this world you're going to find help, the only place, dependable help, that will never leave you, never forsake you, is in the hands of God. Point number one. It's a cell phone service today. Everybody do me a favor. Pull out your cell phone. Pull it out. At least put it on silent and then put it away. <laughs> you can use your Bible app. That's fine. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> point number one, I'm not going to gloss over it. I know we spent a little while on Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. But this point number one that God knows, this is all-inclusive. God knows where you are. God knows who you are because he created you. God knows what you're doing because you can't hide from God. God knows what you need because he created you. And after all, he says that he knew that it wasn't good that man should be alone, so he would make him a helpmate. So God already made your other half. They exist somewhere in your sphere of influence. Now, maybe not at this particular time, maybe not at this particular moment, and this is where I'm going to share with you a little bit of Robert and Kim's story. They were married on Thursday night, the 21st. Was there a specific reason it was the 21st? It was a Thursday. I, I never knew anybody to pick a Thursday wedding, but you did. It was because the two became one. Okay. Okay. Two became one. She picked 21. All right, so, so there, there we go. So there's so a theological meaning behind that. In this particular instance, what I want to share with you is that Robert and Kim did not meet on Thursday night. They did not. <laughs> they met 26 years ago, and they thought the other one was cute. And they were young, and they were in love, and oh, everything was just peachy. Amen? <laughs> they said, yes, that's not the truth. Because if it was, they'd been married for 26 years. But you see, what happens when you're young and you're in love is you don't necessarily understand how love truly works. You don't necessarily understand how you truly work. So in the grander context, what happened is they grew into adults. And adults kind of parted their ways. And adults went off and they lived their own separate lives. And after being apart for 25 years, God brought them back together. <laughs> And in this particular instance, it stuck. I know it stuck. I was at the wedding. <clears throat> and in that particular instance, I want you guys to understand, in, in this moment right now, I think Robert and Kim are sitting there going, man, I wish I wouldn't have done what I had done for the last 25 years. I wish I would have just stayed here with you and we could have made it all work out and everything would have been so much better in my life. Amen. <clears throat> But Robert and Kim are human people, and we make mistakes, amen? amen? And they had gone their separate ways. But in this particular instance, I want you to see that because God had preordained for Robert and Kim to be married, that they had a chance to go off and live their adult lives and to make their choices and to make some of them as mistakes and to learn from those things. And now they've come together, and they're going to have a blessed union for another 26 years, amen? amen. We're supposed to help with that, by the way. This is church responsibility to help the newlywed couple. So uh, <clears throat> let's remember that when we see them here 
after today's date. We're blessed to have them with us, but we're blessed also to have them in our family, and family helps. From Genesis chapter 2, I'm going to ask you to turn to Romans chapter 8. We're going to be there for just a second. We've got two verses. Romans chapter 8. This is building off of the verse in Genesis chapter 2, but in Romans, Romans chapter 8, we're going to read verses 28 and verses 29. And in this particular instance, we're going to see how God has taken what he knew was best for us, which was giving us a helpmate, and how he's put it into practice. And in this particular instance, this verse is going to answer some of those questions because I believe that there are some people who are sitting here going, well, Brother Claude, I'm single. What am I supposed to do? Bum, bum, bum. The Word of God has some advice. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. Brother Claude, I'm still single. What am I supposed to do? Love God. Well, what am I supposed to do while I'm loving God? Do exactly the same thing that Adam was doing in the garden. Being about the business that God had given him to be about, and God will bring to you your helpmate when it is time for your helpmate to be there for you. Well, Brother Claude, what if I've made some mistakes and I've already missed my helpmate? 26 years later, God will reintroduce you. Amen? Amen. Now, if that sounds like an awful long time, it is. If you don't think you want to wait 26 years, you are free to make as many mistakes in that 26 years as you want to make. <laughs> okay, just checking. Because I promise you that when God is ordained for two to become one, two will become one. How do I know? For we know that all things work together for good to those who love God. God's not looking down going, well, I tried to help you out, but you made some mistakes, so now you're on your own. That's not how God works. All things work together for good to those who love God. What's your primary task? Love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Continuing in verse 28. To those who are called according to his purpose... Now, this is the qualifier for the first half of that verse. If you want all things to work together for your good, what do you have to do? You have to love God. When you love God, what happens in response to that? You respond to the calling on his life to be the child that God created you to be. If you want all things to work out for good, what do you do? You love God and you do all of those things that God created you to do. You don't do all of those things the devil tempts you that you want to do. That just means sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, we have to say no. We have to, as responsible adults, look someone in the eye and go, no. Not today. We have to sometimes stand up, look in the mirror, and go, devil, get thee behind me because I'm saying no. Today I'm going to be about the things God created me to be about because I want all things to work out towards my good. So I'm going to love God today with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my strength. Verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. This is the secondary question. Okay, so God, if I love God with all my heart, what am I supposed to do? You're supposed to conform yourself to the image of Jesus Christ. You're supposed to strive every day to be more and more like Christ and less and less like your old self. Let's be honest, most of us don't like our old self because our old self did stuff we don't want to talk about anymore. <laughs> I'm with you, brother. This is one of those I'm preaching from experience. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. What is our goal? To love God and to become more and more like Jesus Christ. Now, this is very clearly a spiritual application here. I'm not asking anybody to have surgery. There's a reason why we don't have a, a, a Photoshop of, of Jesus Christ. 
He's asking us to look, to learn, to study, to grow, and to become more and more like Christ. He's asking us to be focused on that, so solely focused on that, that when the perfect time comes along, he's going to bring to you your better half and deliver that person to you exactly the way he did with Adam in the garden. Adam was at work. He laid down to take a nap. He woke up. Boom, he was married. Some of you wish it happened that way, right? Connor's like, yeah, can it happen? It can, son. It does in Vegas. You don't want to go through that. That's part of the 26 years of, oh, no, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> Drayden, you're now responsible for making sure Connor doesn't go to Vegas. <laughs> Continuing in verse 29, there's more. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That he, Christ, might be the firstborn among many brethren. What is that? That's the duplication of the Christian example. How do we duplicate the Christian example? Not by telling our friends, hey, you know what I think you should do? You should just be more like me. No. You should probably work out some. You should probably go to the range and practice your skills. No, no. We're supposed to tell people, hey, you know what? You're really and truly supposed to be more like Jesus. The firstborn among many brethren is us telling other people, hey, I don't want you to be like me. I don't want you to work like me. I don't want you to look like me. I don't want you to do anything like me. I want you to be the best you you can be. And the only way you can do that is by looking in the mirror and seeing Jesus Christ. So what do I do until God brings me my spouse? I try and conform my life to that of Christ's. Did I do it that way? I'm waiting for my wife to answer. <laughs> That's an honest answer. No, I did not. Do I wish I would have done it that way? Yes, I do. I do. So what can I do? I can help Chance out here. I say, Chance, okay, there's some crazy things happen in this world. There really are, but I want you to be focused on just being the best chance you can be. I want you to be so focused on knowing Jesus Christ that you, you understand who he is and what he does and why he does it, and then you conform your life to that pattern. And, and then Chance is going to go, but, you know, Brother Claude, there's this pretty girl. I'm like, no, don't look at her. <laughs> don't call her. Stay away. They're trouble. They really are. Every man in the room? Those all the single men just said that. <laughs> all the married men aren't saying nothing. <laughs> Ladies, you're worth every bit of the trouble because God created you to be our helpers, comparable to us. It's coming back on. Okay. Good. <clears throat> Point two. Our lives, ladies and gentlemen, are supposed to bring glory to God. The focus of our day is supposed to be, what can I do today to bring glory to God? The, the focus of today is not supposed to be, you know what, I really need to find my better half. Your better half is going to get to you when God is ready for your better half to get here. So right now, what you really need to focus on is you because you really and truly are a hot mess. Let's just be honest. We all were at some point in our lives. Drayden's going to claim it, okay. In this particular instance, we need to understand that it might not be time for us to find our significant other. That it might just be time for us to be alone so that we can focus on us. And then as we continue to focus on us, then, then we will grow closer and closer to that Christ-likeness of which we are supposed to be. Then God can look down from heaven and say, okay, now you're ready, Jared. And when God says, now you're ready, I want you to remember that Adam woke up and all of a sudden he was married. That's how fast it happens. When God says that it's time, now you're ready, it's going to happen. And in this particular instance, if you have tried to make it happen without the glory of God and it has failed miserably, I just want you to know you're not alone. Many of us have tried that too, amen? Is it just me? Y'all are quiet this morning. I'm sorry, honey. I tell my kids I never dated anybody before my wife. That's what I tell my kids. Yes, it's a lie. <laughs> it's 
what I tell them. From Romans chapter 8, now I want to go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. So turn in your Old Testament to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. I was supposed to be done already. I'm behind schedule. I apologize. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. We're going to read verses 9 through 12. And I clearly want you guys to understand that we're reading out of the Word of God. So this is the Word of God that He delivered to mankind so that we could have it forever and ever and ever. And we could learn from these things. And in this particular instance, I'm going to read this biblical passage to you. I believe that you've heard it before. But I want to expound upon it in just a, a little bit so that maybe you can think about how God is trying to relay this message to you. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Now, in this particular instance, I know some of you are people persons, and I know some of you are just really, I want to be left alone type people. I understand that. But even if you're that person where you want to be left alone, you understand that when someone shows up and they help, that the work goes a lot faster. Amen? You, you have a good return for your labor when the two of you are working together. If the two of you are working well together, you have a very good reward. If the two of you are clashing and butting heads, you might not be getting much done, but this is supposed to be for the greater glory of God. So in this particular instance, he says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. What is our labor as Christians? Anybody know? Baby Christians. What is your reward? Your family. Your, your family, your, your children that God blesses you with, your, your grandchildren that God blesses you with, your, your nieces and your nephews and your brothers and your sisters are a blessing from God. And when the two of you are working together, you have a good reward. You guys have no idea how, how good it makes me feel that when I'm here on Sunday morning, I'm here with my son. My daughter went to Children's Church to help with that. My wife's sitting there as well. My mother-in-law is right there. You see, I, I, I am blessed because the two of us came together. We both knew Christ. We both had been saved. We both had been baptized. Now, I'm not saying I did everything right. I'm just saying that I, I kind of had part of my mind right, a little bit of it. And the rest of it, she helped me with. It's hard work, baby. The flip side of that is, like, she had her mind a little bit right, too. A little bit. And I was supposed to help her with some of it. Supposed to. And I tried. I don't know if I've been much successful or not, but here we are. And my son and my daughter and my wife and my mother-in-law are here. My stepfather-in-law. <laughs> I have a good reward for the labor that I've put forward for the greater glory of God. Continuing to verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. What is your helpmate supposed to do? She's supposed to encourage you. She's supposed to help you. She's supposed to lift you up. You know what you're not supposed to do? You're not supposed to whine and complain and tear somebody down. I'm just saying if we're going to do this, let's just do it right. Let's see what the, the helpmate says we're supposed to do. If they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls. He has no one to help him up. And I know that there are people in this room that have felt like that they have fallen down and there's nobody there to help them up. But that's not true. In the first place, if you're doing this right, you're plugged into a Christian family and that family is there to help you. That you are part of something greater than just yourself. If you've invited Jesus Christ into your heart, you're not alone sitting somewhere going, oh, woe is me. You're in the middle of God's plan for your life. But don't you understand in this particular instance, Scripture is not saying that that plan is going to be perfect. It's not because sometimes you fall. So walking that aisle, surrendering your life to Christ, doesn't mean you're not going to have trouble anymore. What it means is that when you have trouble, you have help. Verse 11. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? I know that some of you are talkers and some of you are listeners. And those of you who are talkers, even when you're in a room by yourself, you're talking to yourself. Amen? And let's be honest. Those of you who are talkers, after you talk to yourself, you answer yourself too, don't you? Amen? Those of you who are listeners, when you're sitting in the room and you're not talking, what do you hear? Silence. But it's not good for man to be alone. 
So I'll create a helper comparable for him. And you're not in silence. Because you've got to be careful sometimes when you're in silence. Sometimes when you're in silence, that's when the devil whispers to you, hey, maybe you should try this. That's why you need your helper. You, you need your spouse. You need your Christian family to be there for you so that you don't fall. And if you do fall, we pick you up. And we don't do it going, man, did you fall again? We go up, man, oh, are you okay? It's so good that you're here. I'm glad I can pick you up. Because we don't want people to think that we're picking on them because they fail. Because in reality, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. And none of us has the right or the privilege to stand up and say, why can't you just be more like me? When we're supposed to say, Jesus loves you so much that he died for you. So that you could conform your life and be more like him. Verse 12. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. All right, so verse 12 is going to take me a minute. Oh, I got two minutes. Okay, I can do this. The first portion of this verse, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him. In this particular instance, I want to point out it says him. In this particular instance, I want you to see that right here in Scripture, God is identifying that your enemy is the devil. Your enemy is not your spouse. It's not. Your spouse is your helpmate who's comparable to you. Your enemy is the devil. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Now, how did we go from one and two to now we're talking about three? And in this particular instance, I want to expand your mind for just a second here. So give me a second. In this particular instance, I want you to read this again. And a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know what that means? That means that you and your spouse, well, that's only two. You need something else in your life to make sure that you're not broken. And that that thing that's supposed to be in your life was that thing that was supposed to be there before your spouse showed up because you were created to be about the business of God. And God Tony's got a key back there. He's like, Claude, you're done. Sorry. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. And I want you to understand that that cord doesn't have three strands that runs one beside each other, but they're so interwoven together that one draws its strength off of the other. So the husband draws his strength from the wife. The wife draws his strength, her strength from the husband. The husband and wife together draw their strength from God. And that's the cord that's not quickly broken. Point number three. God designed us to need him. He didn't design us to do it by ourselves. So that's point number three for today's message. So I'm going to ask Jared to come up. Jared, what song is it? 435 in your hymnals, ladies and gentlemen. I want you guys to... Stand and sing. I want you to know that the altar is open if you want to come and pray. I want you to know that the altar is continuously open. If you want to come down and pray when we're singing our songs, come down and pray. If you want to come down and pray while I'm preaching, come down and pray. The altar of God never closes. I, I want you to know that the altar is here for anyone who wants to pray. I want you to know Brother Virgil is here. If you want to come down and ask spiritual questions or just ask for prayer, Brother Virgil will do that for you. I also want you to know that this is that time that if you feel God calling on your heart, Step out, walk the aisle, and join the congregation here at New Colony Baptist Church. We are not perfect. We just try to do the best we can with the help of God.